Today, I invite you to join me on a voyage through the heart and soul of Rastafarianism, a unique blend of faith, culture, and resilience that has captivated hearts and minds around the world. From the bustling streets of Kingston to the serene hills of Ethiopia, Rastafarianism has woven its way into the fabric of society, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of those who dare to embrace its teachings. But what exactly is Rastafarianism, you might ask? We've all heard of Rastafarians but how many of us know what they believe? Well, get ready to be swept away by the mesmerizing tale of Rastafarianism, a journey filled with passion, spirituality, and a profound connection to the roots of humanity. Rastafarianism is one of the Abrahamic religions alongside Islam Christianity and Christianity and Judaism to name the three large ones in the group they can all be broken down into their respective divisions and sects the Rastafari belief set draws mostly from Christian teachings and scriptures. Well, it's quite a traditionalist literalist reading of the scriptures, so it does have more features in common with Judaism. Jah is very important to him and is the Rastafari word for God it is a shortening of Jehovah which is one of the names of God in Hebrew. Rastology is this particular Rastafari interpretation of the Bible which is quite traditionalist and literalist for example most Rastafari people wore rasters as they are shortly known as not eating pork because it's forbidden in Leviticus as well as then wearing dreadlocks which are very famous because it says in Leviticus not to take the knife to the skin etc. and this Rastology also is often interpreted by these people as meaning that black people were the chosen race of God, the chosen people and one of the tribes of Israel. Liberty is another word. That is used and it's the Rastafari way of life now often they try to live naturally in the most natural way possible. Often going back to patriarchal structures of society as well as then wearing dreadlocks and not following certain societal conformities. Now this all goes back to a man named Marcus Garvey who was a big inspiration for the Rastafari movement he was a pan-Africanist and also believed that Africans should feel more empowered in the modern world. And it's thanks to his teachings coming to Jamaica in the 1930s that the descendants of slaves started to form what would become the Rastafari movement. The Ethiopian esteem moment also very much influenced the Rastafari who would go on to take this idea much further and was essential that the black church often felt that they were too much under the control of white people at the time so they looked to Ethiopia whether was an Ethiopian Orthodox church that had been run by black people for millennia and they tried to emulate this. This was on top of also Pan-African ideas which were seeking the empowerment and further civil rights for black people and the African diaspora as a whole. This was often met with this idea of repatriation to Africa of sending black people who were in the Caribbean and North America as well as other parts of the world and who had been taken there as slaves to send their descendants back to Africa as some kind of promised land. And this is where another term used in Rastafari circles Zion comes from this is the promised land of Africa. Zion originally means Jerusalem but in the Rastafari context, it's used for Africa although sometimes more specifically as Ethiopia. As well Babylon is then the obverse of Zion Babylon in the Bible of course is where the Jews are sent in exile as slaves under the Babylonians and so Babylon in a Rastafari context are the oppressive western lands where they believe black people are being oppressed and that they should return to Africa their promised land and especially Ethiopia as well. Now there's a reason that Ethiopia has such a prominent position in all of this and for Rastafari and I will explain why. Now again it goes back to Marcus Garvey because he said in 1920 look to Africa when a black king shall be crowned for the day of deliverance is at hand and just a decade later when a man named Haile Selassie became the emperor of Ethiopia. Many Africans believed that this prophecy had indeed come true now within five years the Italians had invaded Haile Selassie's European Empire in the Second Italo-European War. And although they fought bravely eventually the Ethiopians using largely spears and swords against the Italians tanks and heavy machine guns were defeated after a bitter struggle. However, Haile Selassie and the British would return in 1941. During the North Africa campaigns of the Second World War and together they were able to defeat the Italian colonizers there and he, he was able to reclaim the Ethiopian throne. Now all of this and especially the Time magazine's articles of his coronation all reached Jamaica and people there really believed that this man the man prophesied by Marcus Garvey to come was a sign that times were changing folder and this is why Haile Selassie gets such a prominent position in the Rastafari movement. And the very name Rastafari isn't the name of the movement originally. 
It was the name of Hylas Lassie because Rasa is the Ethiopian word for the kind of lord or head and he was known as Tafari Makoen so his name is now the name of the movement. That came to worship him in that form now actually Jaff just after this many people in Jamaica who associated with the Rasta movement tried to seize the towns of Kingston and Spanish town and add it to this new Ethiopian empire thinking that the time had come for them. However, these were violently put down by the authorities at the time. However when Jamaica became independent in 1962 relations somewhat eased with the Rastafari population inside Jamaica and they were able to forge the Jamaican government the Ethiopian Empire good relations because of the worship of Haile Selassie. As the second coming of Christ or the second incarnation of Christ or a prophet of Jah depending on the interpretation by the Rastafari people in question leading to his state visit to Jamaica in 1966. Where tens possibly hundreds of thousands of people came to watch him land in Kingston and they surrounded his aircraft and thought that the Messiah had landed in Jamaica. And actually one of the people in the crowd there very importantly was a young girl called Rita Anderson and although she wasn't a Rastafari when she went when she came back she was so influenced by having seen Haile Selassie. And she said later that she had seen the stigmata of the holes where the nails had punctured through Christ's palms when he was on the cross on Haile Selassie's hand when he waved at the crowd. So she went home and told her boyfriend Bob all about it and of course, this was a huge moment in history because that Bob was Bob Marley. And his songs he later converted to Rastafari as well to that belief said and may have the songs have his reggae songs, of course, have these very strong lines of Rastafari influence going through them. The song Iron Lion Zion is actually about Haile Selassie himself and his struggle against the Italians. Song sent Buffalo Soldier to look at the oppression of various black people throughout history and the story as well as citing the dreadlock Rasta. One Drop also reveals things like revelation and redemption and strong associations with the Bible. As well as the song War which is a war who was most of the lyrics were from a speech delivered by Haile Selassie to the UN Council and of course, Bob Marley became such a popular reggae star that as well with the rust of foreign messages of his music. It became a global phenomenon and lots of people flocked to the new religion, especially in Jamaica and the African diaspora. Now another common thing that's well known about Rastafari is the use of marijuana or cannabis within the group and actually, this is a very important part of the ritual side of the Rastafari movement as they believe that it brings people closer to God to jail but also that it makes people self-reflect more unless they see as a good thing as it's a natural thing. Now at groundings which are Rastafari ceremonies essentially lots of people get together or a group of people get together a new chanting and drumming and pass around a doobie or a spliff or whatever you want to call it and they smoke the ganja together. Which is also the Jamaican term for weed or marijuana I mean I know way too many of these terms but it's a Dutch thing. So I assure you it's all fine but actually surprisingly to some weed isn't legal in Jamaica and this has put them Morini Rastafari as well as in the diaspora wherever they are in the world in conflict with the law and often gives them a bad reputation. Because they are the ones who are going and smoking marijuana even when it's illegal because they claim that it's an important part of their religious practice now actually many of the Rastafari did go over to Africa and repatriate with one of their goals and even in Ethiopia as Haile Selassie in 1948 gave a town Shashamane to the various African people living out in the diaspora and said that they could come and settle there. Which many Rastafari people did mostly from Jamaica. But also others from the Caribbean islands and other places in the world and at one point over 2000 people were living in Shashamane who would come there as Rastafari. However, in 1972, that was a very bad famine in the north of Ethiopia coupled with a collapse in the price of oil the following year. This led to a lot of social discontentment Haile Selassie went on national television and announced price freezes so that people would be more in a stable situation. As well as other measures to control the decline in the country but the flood of aid workers gave the impression that he was no longer in proper control and could do nothing about the plight of the people. The Soviet-backed coup of communist inclined lower-ranking army officers called the Derg ousted Haile Selassie in a coup in 1974. Starting a period that would see increased famines throughout Ethiopia as well as the imprisonment and execution of tens of thousands of political opposition including the grandson of Haile Selassie himself. Haile Selassie was not long for the earth and soon after died in imprisonment in 1975. He was followed shortly after by Bob Marley in 1981. 
and the twin deaths of these remembering that Haile Selassie was the man that Rastafari believed was Jesus Christ come again on earth shook to the core. The belief said of the Rastafari if he could be killed on earth then many of them simply refused to believe he was dead. And others abandoned the Rastafari belief set all along Bob Marley on the other hand was not religiously seen as an important figure but culturally he was very important for spreading the message. And he was one of the biggest reasons why the Rastafari belief set came to so many people with his death and the rumors that he had converted to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church on his deathbed. This was also a blow to the Rastafari cause however today there are still Rastafari all over the world mostly concentrated in the African diaspora as well as of course Jamaica where there are still several tens of thousands. If not more and people who I think hundreds of thousands and who are identifying as Rastafari although they make up only around 1% of the population of Jamaica. Now in Africa as well of course Ethiopia there are still Rastafari as well as communities in Kenya Zimbabwe Nigeria and Ghana. The fascinating story of Rastafarianism. I hope you've enjoyed this journey as much as I have. Until next time, stay blessed and keep spreading love and positivity. 1. Love. Oh. Give me a thumbs up don't forget to hit the bell notification and subscribe.